think we've got enough attendees here that we can start. Um, so again, welcome everyone to our Marcus Smith Think webinar, um, creating an impactful CTV campaign. So uh, just to do a little introduction on myself, my name is Nicole Chiarella. I am the Director of Corporate Marketing here at Market Smith and your MC for today's session. So to start off, I just wanna go through a little bit of housekeeping. Right now, um, you should see a control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If you can't see it, it may be collapsed. So to expand, click on the orange um, button with the white arrow to see more options. Everyone is automatically muted, so don't worry if your dog starts barking. We won't hear it on our end, although if mine does, you, you will hear that. <laughs> uh, your active participation is important during the session. You can ask questions throughout, um, and we'll be answering them towards the end of the session. So there's a question module within your control panel. Feel free to put your questions in there. Um, they'll be sent directly to me throughout um, without the ability for any of the attendees to see them, so you won't worry about you know, um, bothering anyone. And then just so everyone knows, a recorded version of this webinar will be available um, at the end. Um, we'll send them out to everyone via email and they'll also be available on our social pages, which you see here. Um, please be sure to follow us, join the conversation, tag us. Our handles are at Market Smith Inc. across Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, so please, feel free to follow us there. All right, if everyone's ready, we can get started here. So for those of you um, who are not familiar with MarketSmith, we are an award-winning full-service marketing agency located in Whitney, New Jersey. We have a proven history in driving growth for brands at all stages in their life cycle. From product launches to changing brand perception, we approach every campaign with transparency, end-to-end -end measurement, and ROI-driven goals. So now, a little bit about today's panelists. I'll start here with Samantha Foy, who is the Senior Vice President of Media here at Mark Smith. Sam brings 11 plus years of digital media and industry experience to Market Smith, where she plans and executes digital campaigns for a wide range of our clients. Her multi-channel knowledge includes programmatic, search, social, and media operations. Sam is always on her toes, addressing strategies, adapting to marketplace trends, and adopting new digital approaches to meet our client goals. And uh, she also stays on her toes outside of work as an avid salsa dancer. So welcome, Sam. And next, we have uh, Mike Zimbard, who is the owner and CCO of E1 Studios, um, who has been so kind to join us today for this webinar. Marcus Smith and E1 are great collaborators. Uh, we've partnered on many campaigns, most recently, we wrapped uh, two actually for the state of New Jersey for their Get Covered New Jersey Insurance and Reach New Jersey Opioid Campaign. So as I mentioned, Mike is the owner of E1 Studios and he's been the driving force behind his growth over the past decade. He joined the company during its infancy in 2001 and then ultimately took the reins in 2010 playing a key role in diversifying E1's creative offerings and establishing their 3D design division that has now become a cornerstone of the company. He's a Syracuse University Newhouse alum and has been part of the post side of advertising for over 20 years. Mike is proud to say he loves what he does and over the years has gained a reputation for keeping cool under pressure and always going the extra mile to deliver for his clients. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us. All right. Um, so what we are going to talk about today is connected TV, how we utilize the tactics for our clients in our media planning and buying, and also um, partnering with studios like E1 to bring our campaigns to life visually. Connected TV 
is growing rapidly as a media tactic. And in fact, U.S. viewers of Connected TV uh, will top 223.3 million in 2022, which actually represents 66.2% of the population. And in order to capitalize on that audience, we are seeing figures that brands and advertisers are going to spend $18.89 billion on connected TV campaigns this year, which is a 33% jump since 2021. So it is really growing as a tactic, as I said. So I think we should let's, you know, jump right into it here. Um, connected TV is definitely different than the standard over the air or cable television that has been around since the late 1950s. So Sam, um, I'll pitch this one to you. Can you explain what connected TV is? Yeah, and first of all, thank you so much um, for everyone who's attending. This is probably one of my favorite topics to talk about, so I'm really excited about today. Um, so I wanna start by defining not only CTV, but some of the other acronyms um, probably here, which one of them is OTT, and those terms are kind of used interchangeably in the industry, but they do have slightly different meanings. So, meaning, so I, I think it's important to start there. Connected TV is really exactly what it sounds like. It's referring to the actual TV and how that TV is able to connect to the internet. So whether it's a smart TV and that technology is built right into the, the device, um, or you're using a separate device with a non-smart TV to connect to the internet. So that would be like a Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick. Um, it also includes gaming consoles that allow you to connect to the internet as well. So anytime you hear that term connected TV, that's what's being referred to. In contrast, OTT or over the top is really the term that's used to describe how consumers are streaming video content, which is without a cable or, or satellite subscription. So it's really the delivery of the streaming video, regardless regardless on, of what device you're, you're using. So it could refer to someone who's watching streaming content on their mobile phone. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a connected TV, but you are accessing video content content over the internet without a cable or satellite subscription. Um, and then that gets broken down further, right? So we, there's um, ad video on demand, subscription video on demand, and then transactional video on demand. And it gets pretty technical, but really it means ad VOD is anything that's ad supported. SVOD is subscription based. So the Netflix and the Amazons and the Disney's of the world. Um, and then transactional is when you're making a one-time purchase for a piece of content. So if you go to Amazon and you want to buy a new, a new movie that just came out, that would be considered transactional VOD. Um, so those are all the, the buckets within the overarching OTT or CTV space. And then, of course, when we're talking about linear TV, that's the traditional way of watching television live um, through a cable or satellite subscription. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the terminology and, and where we're going to kick off today. Acronyms abound just everywhere. <laughs> Love our acronyms in media. <laughs> so many options, so many different streaming things, which I feel like I pay for a lot of them. But anyway, <laughs> thanks, Sam. Um, it, it is really interesting, though, to see how TV has changed over time. So, Mike, um, on your end, on the production and creative side, what um, has changed for you on how to make sure you're being efficient, you know, with that actual production of the spots that are being shown? Are there different needs for standard versus CTV? Yeah, I mean, I think where we're definitely seeing an increase is just in the amount of deliverables being being requested for for production. Um, with especially with something like CTV, it's wonderful in the sense that you could get these very targeted ad buys. But in doing that, you have potentially many different iterations of of content that you would like to to put out there. So where this starts stressing production a bit is there's uh, a large amount of deliverables that you'll want to you'll want to capture on on a shoot day but how can you be the most efficient with that and from from our standpoint as a production partner we want to get involved as early in the process 
to really advise uh, strategically and, and find the most efficiencies when it comes to shooting so that you're not over-promising something to a client uh, or not being overly in and try to catch a given day that might ultimately sacrifice on the overall uh, creative. We're, we're all for always trying to maximize what can be captured you know, during the course of a, of a shoot day um, because that's gonna just help reduce your overall costs. It's gonna multiply your overall output during post, um, but definitely involve your production partner uh, as early as you can and keep them in the loop of, of communication as much as you can so that they're helping you properly pre-plan and streamline production so that the day is as successful as can be and all of the content that's needed is captured but not at the overall expense of, of the creative itself. Nicole, you know, and I, I think Mike, you brought up um, a really great point and, and something that I think um, isn't always captured this early on in the planning stages, right? Where we are thinking about our media strategy and who we're trying to reach coupled with what does the creative need to look like? And to your point, when we're talking about CTV, it's digital in nature. We have the opportunity to personalize our message to specific targets or subgroups. And we know that's gonna make it a more impactful media campaign, but how do you ma balance that with the production cost as you were saying? So I think one of the important things is to align on those things early on um, in the process um, and plan ahead for it. 100%, yeah, absolutely. So, Mike, do you have, um, well, I know you have, spoiler alert, an example <laughs> of a couple of, of how you've done this where you've had to kind of shoot multiple ways for, for one campaign? Yes, yeah, so I, I thought this would be, uh, you know, worthwhile to, to review. This was some work we did for Dramamine um, uh, earlier in, uh, in the year. And the, the, we faced a couple of challenges here. One, we only had budget for a single shoot day, um, but the ambition was high and the request of deliverables were high. This was gonna be concurrently capturing broadcast um, and CTV campaigns on, on the same day. Um, so when we first got involved, there were some different creative overall for the broadcast campaigns and the CTV campaigns um, we were able to work with the agency and, and kind of figure out the way we could utilize setups across all of them so that we weren't trying to capture too much in the day as far as setups go. Um, the other kind of curveball that came out, and we'll, we'll, you'll see this in the examples, is that this was going to be shot about two to three months before Dramamine released all new packaging. So they wanted to ultimately cover the creative with the packaging that was in store at the time, but then mm -hmm. future proof it. And what we were originally asked to do was shoot an exact setup with the new packaging, um, which really with everything that was being asked in the day would have been completely impossible. So our recommendation was to shoot with one set of packaging only and then have us go in and post and have the VFX team um, digitally create the alternate package. So that not only saved time on the day, but it also created a scenario where you had complete parity between the performance and the creative in both spots. Whereas if you were actually trying to do this in camera, there would have been slight differences and it wouldn't have really been the exact same, uh, a one-to-one -one between the spots. So the first example of the spot here, this is what we shot in camera. This has um, one type of packaging in it and you could, you'll see the full 15 spot here. And of course my sound for some reason is not working. Give me one second here. Um, 
I mean, I if you, I, I could, I could talk over this, uh, Nicole, if you want. No, hold on. No, hold on. No, hold on. No. So that's essentially kind of the base version of the spot. You have ultimately people suffering with, you know, nausea and, and uh, some motion sickness up, up front. But it was a lot to cover in the day. We had a car. We had we had different, you know, moving pieces going on. So ultimately, then we took that exact version of the spot, and then the second iteration of the spot ultimately re we replaced all the packages in the tabletop setup, and then replaced them within the context of the scenes themselves. So this you'll see here uh, if you play down. So it's the identical spot, um, but all of the um, all of the packaging is replaced. So it's it's one to one what the what the uh, initial version was. And then on the CTV side, they had an, a, an alternate skew that they basically weren't using for broadcast. And this is where we had gotten involved in, and we simplified the opening setup of this and got this down to the point where all we needed to do was shoot a single close-up of a, of a hand using this ginger chew, which was the, which was the alternate product. And then we're able to repurpose the opening from the broadcast and everything else we said we'll do in CG with the packaging in this. So it was it was really a way to only add one setup for this particular campaign that also was able to condense the shooting day. So here you'll see like basically similar setups up front. They have slightly different ins and out points. And then we're in a different scenario. That's that additional close up we needed to shoot. And then the rest of this was all handled in post. Um, so again, just uh, while they had a lot to do and there were other iterations uh, for CTV that went out, but everything was able to get done just during that course of that 10 to 12 hour day. Technical detectable, Okay. Good. <laughs> now, this is never something that happens when we're doing a shoot. I, I'll tell you that much, right? <laughs> but what I was saying was, it is, it's really interesting to see what goes into something that most people only see, you know, for a few seconds. So I, I know what it takes to go, that goes into like a full day of shooting, but it's crazy. And especially in the post, there's so many things that I'm sure you guys deal with and have to add in to, to make sure that you're you're getting your targeting and everything right um, to whatever Sam and, and team are planning from the media end. So uh, over to you, Sam, with a tactic that seems to be so ever evolving, how do you make sure from a media standpoint that you're keeping up with trends and uh, make sure that, you know, as a tactic, it's working for our clients? Yeah, so there's, as you mentioned, a lot has been going on um, in this space. So we've seen that cord cutting, the act of, of getting rid of your cable or, or satellite subscription has, the rate has slowed, but there's a projected 55 million Americans that have or are cutting the cord. I actually cut my cord about a month ago. 
Um, and, you know, while that rate has slowed, um, it, there, it doesn't count the people that never had a cable or, sub, or satellite subscription to begin with. So all of those, that younger generation coming out, you know, they're graduating college, they're getting their own homes or apartments, and they're never even getting a, a subscription. There's about 35 million of those currently. Um, and then we look at the giants like Netflix, there are more Netflix subscribers than there are cable and satellite uh, subscribers combined, um, which is pretty, which is pretty crazy. Um, and we look, you know, don't get me wrong, TV is still a massive audience, right? Um, huge reach, but it's more so, it's continuing to skew more towards that 50 plus age range. They're really not cutting the cord as much. They're still watching traditional TV, but it's really those 18 to 49 year olds where we're seeing them cut the cord at a, at a much higher rate or not get a subscription at all. And as such, we've seen broadcast ratings really decline. And we're talking about on average 80% decline in ratings since 2011, which is massive. Um, and it's yeah. really been a struggle, um, you know, for for these networks and you know media buyers, right, to make sure that we're hitting our goals, our GRP goals, um, our reach goals. So you've seen the shift from a media standpoint with the the linear TV networks coupling a lot of their buys with their streaming content because it's really the only way at this point to make sure that we're we're hitting our goals um, because of how many people have moved away from watching linear TV. And then you know you have the giants like Disney Plus and Netflix, which have traditionally been subscription based, now offering ad supported, which is a really big game changer from a media perspective for a few reasons. One, there are massive audiences that we have not been able to reach through advertising at this point. Um, and two, from a data perspective, they have so much data on their on their customers from just who they are in general, but their their habits. So it's really gonna be interesting to see how that data is opened up to the advertising world and what, what's gonna come out of that. Um, and then, you know, the other part of this is Disney owning, you know, it's Disney owning ABC and Hulu and this shift that we're seeing from traditional linear content shows that are very popular like Dancing with the Stars announcing that they're no longer going to be available on live TV. It's all going to be through streaming. Um, same thing with sports. We've seen this with the NFL. They are removing their deal with DirecTV, this 30 plus year deal and moving their content. Um, Thursday Night Football is moving exclusively to Amazon. Um, so it's really gonna be interesting to see how, how the marketplace has to shift to accommodate these what, what's happening in the marketplace. Um, but the other interesting thing too is when we think about live TV and live uh, you know, streaming services that offer live TV outside of cable and, and satellite, um, YouTube being one of them, Hulu Live, Sling, they're, number of subscribers is actually a lot lower than the amount of people who are moving away from from linear tv so we have five we just hit five million of youtube live hulu live has about four million slang two and a half million so in my mind that's telling me the people that are moving away from their subscription tv their their live television is not missing that content and it's really no surprise there's just so much content available new content um whether it's YouTube or it, it's a produced piece of content from Netflix or Amazon, um, there's so many options and, and we're not missing live TV. So, so really, really interesting. Um, I don't think of anything else I wanted to hit on, but yeah, uh, that, that's really it. I think from, a, from an effective media strategy standpoint, linear TV is still gonna be core, um, especially when we wanna hit that older target at a massive reach. Um, but I think there needs to be a shift in the way that we're thinking about connected TV. It used to kind of be like a supplement to our linear buys when I really think this is going to move to core to our strategy is a digital streaming play, um, while still using linear, but it's really kind of a core strategy going forward. So, um, 
this is all extremely interesting. And I'd actually like to get our audience involved in a quick poll. So now that you all know a little bit of more about CTV, depending on what you knew before coming into this, we want to know um, what are you watching these days on your streaming and connected TV services? So if you could just put your answers um, in the, the question box, and I'll read a few off. All right, I see a couple good ones coming in here. Um, inventing Anna, which I have not seen yet, but I've heard good things about. Um, Severance as well. Apple TV is one of the ones that I'm like holding out on. It's the only one I feel like I don't pay for, but you know, that one. Uh, Ted Lasso, I saw they uh, just won, I think an Emmy, um, at least uh, people on the show did the other day. Um, the new Game of Thrones show, which I personally am watching. I'm an episode behind, so no spoilers here. Let's see what else. Anything else? Only Murders in the Building, another good one. Um, but again, I feel like all of these are all on different stations, and it's really funny to me. Well, stations, not stations, <laughs> on, on all these different platforms. So it's really, it's funny, um, you know, to see what people are watching. So. All right, those are some great ones and ones I definitely have to add to my own list. So now that we've gone through the basics and the trends surrounding connected TV, um, I'd love for you both to give some more examples on how um, you've utilized it for clients. So Sam, I'll, I'll take it over to you to start off. Yeah, so um, love fact, we've had a a robust connected TV strategy as part of our core media plans um, for a few years now. But last year, when we were launching their new product, Self Tech, um, we wanted to do something bigger with more of a content partnership integration. Um, so we, you know, we approached Amazon. The Wheel of Time was a series that was just launching at the same time that the Self Tech product was launching, and it made there was a lot of synergy there and um, we kind of blew out what that partnership looked like in terms of a media perspective, adding Amazon um, Fire TV as well as IMDB as a part of our plans, um, and then ran a spot, which I know Mike will touch on, um, that incorporated the actual content from the show into our video commercial, which was um, used across the entire campaign, across all of our digital video tactics. Yeah, so I'll, to, to Sam's point, <clears throat> what was interesting here was the initial LoveSec campaign that we had um, done the visual effects and, and post on um, had, had aired. Um, and so different from what I was talking on before about as far as pre-planning for your production, this was all a, a case where the work was already done. But when Mark and Smith was able to create this Amazon relationship and the opportunity to do a cross promotion with, with Wheel of Time, we had this broadcast spot that was able to be repurposed in after the fact um, and ultimately be able to be re-aired with uh, and, and um, on uh, CTV buys as well um, with the Wheel of Time component in it. So we were able to recreate the middle portion of the spot um, that was specifically branded for Wheel of Time, but sort of tying it all into uh, Love Sex. So um, there were, uh, we can take a look at the initial spot and then can show you the, the adaptation for uh, the Wheel of Time promo. All right, I'm gonna do some magic quick movement here so that these work properly, so give me a sec. So ultimately here, this was the original broadcast spot showing the product and then ultimately introducing 
um, Stealth Tech, which was able to, it has USB charging capability built into it, and then an entire surround system built in. The initial ad just featured sort of a generic movie that the family was watching of, you know, a Jurassic Park type movie with this holographic representation to, to kind of play up the, the Stealth Tech branding. Um, and then the, the redo of it, um, we just pulled a short snippet of, of the section that we then revised for Wheel of Time. We were able to take that section of the family watching TV, put the Wheel of Time branding in the TV, and then ultimately create sort of a new holographic imagery behind them that was lifted directly from uh, an episode of the show. So that you'll see here, now we've replaced that dinosaur and we have this completely different holograph behind them. And in this case, this was, you know, ultimately spinning off another version after the spot was already done, um, which was, um, you know, a basically great leveraging of the content. Um, and there's many opportunities, I think, to look for in, in CTV for that as well, where you can target different audiences. You can, you know, see how one version of a spot performs against another, depending on, you know, what demographic it's being shown to and just the myriad of possibilities that sort of CTV opens up to you from a, a metric standpoint and the ability to put all these different versions out there. So that is it, um, unless Mike or Sam, you guys have anything else you wanted to add before we jump into some questions? Nope. All right, cool. So um, before we jump into questions, I just wanted to say thank you uh, both for joining us. And Mike, it's always a pleasure to partner with you and E1. Um, so before we dive in, I just want to remind everyone um, to follow us on our social channels. We share lots of information, client updates, and agency happenings daily. So we hope you'll stay in touch. And I'm just gonna give it a second to see um, if there are any questions um, that anyone has for either Mike or Sam. Um, I'll give it a minute. So if anyone wants to put a couple in here and um, I will ask them. All right, so the first one we have here is, um, and I, I'm gonna to go to Sam for this one. Uh, what are the best success metrics to utilize in tracking and reporting on connected TV campaigns? Yeah, so from a standard tracking standpoint, it's very similar to linear in that most CTV offerings are non-clickable, um, even if you're watching on your mobile device, right? So it's really about impressions, and video completion, which for the most part, close to 100%, people are watching a piece of content because they wanna get through the content, they're gonna sit through your video commercial, right? Um, but you know what, what we do at MSI is, is unique in that um, we create panel tests um, dependent on the client you know, and what their KPI is to measure outside of just the standard delivery metrics. Um, if we want to measure what is the CTV impact to, to sales ultimately, we will create a panel, a local panel test to, to be able to do that type of testing. Um, and then outside of that, you know, a, a bunch of our partners also offer conversion lift tests as well, foot traffic tests. Um, so there are other measurement strategies um, depending on what our clients' KPIs are that we can add on top of that. Um, and then, you know, in the, the benefit of CTV being digital and our ability to target separate audiences, you're obviously getting a lot more out of what happened with your CTV by from an audience perspective and how you are targeting um, versus what you would get from linear TV, which is just general, you know, whatever demo you bought. Um, and that's, that's how it delivered. Cool. All right. So the next question here, I'll, Start with Mike, but I think you both could answer this for for some different reasons. So, um, what is the most popular length of spot for CTV? So, I guess Mike, what are you shooting the most of? And then maybe Sam on your end, what from an inventory standpoint do you see the most? I, for us, 
over the past um, couple of years, we're, we're definitely shooting a lot more 15s um, uh, with the option of, you know, basically being able to create a 30, but the, the, the main buys, at least that we're seeing and what we're putting out first are, are 15s and then more and more mini um, six and eights and tens. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I agree completely. Um, I think when we're talking about CTV, 15, 15s and 30s would be your standard, right? Because if you're watching a show, that's what consumers are used to. But we know from an attention standpoint of consumers, the shorter the better, um, because we don't want them tuning out and missing missing the whole point, right? So, um, but to your point, Mike, when we're we're there's this crossover of what is considered OTT video. Um, and I think the lines have been blurred a bit between social and, and streaming. Um, TikTok has come out and said that they don't think Instagram is their competitor, right? They think Netflix is their competitor. Um, and I think it's the way this younger generation is consuming content from the get-go. They're not they don't know what TV is. <laughs> My kids definitely don't know what TV is. Um, it's, it's a different definition for them. You know they're on YouTube, they're on they're on TikTok, um, and they're they're not necessarily watching video content on a connected TV device. So I think um, the other interesting part too on the TikTok side, being different from an Instagram, we always say the shorter the better because they're they're moving so quickly and to get their attention on on a platform like Instagram, you need to get that going in three seconds. Um, mm -hmm. But on TikTok, there's this shift where that is the source of entertainment and they're spending hours and hours watching content and they're sitting through longer lengths of video. Um, so it's really this kind of interest, interesting dynamic that's happening with what what is really considered OTT these days now with these, these platforms that are coming out. Yep. All right, and now the last question we have here is, and I'll, Pitch this to you, Sam, but Mike, you may have, um, actually, we just got another one in. So we'll start with this one. How are you dealing with brand safety and suitability? So brand safety, that's a tough one because of the amount of content available in the open web, right? We know what the big players are, um, but there are all of these other platforms like the Pluto TVs of the world that have a ton of video content um, and there, there's little control on our part. Um, we, when we do programmatic buying, where we're really just targeting the audience, it doesn't matter where they're getting their, their streaming video content from, we have um, brand safety platforms in place to make sure that their, the content is suitable um, based on whatever the client's needs are. So there's, you know, double verify, um, that's pre-bid, we're making sure there's no bot um, traffic or inventory that's coming through. Um, there's content filters that we can put on there as well if there's certain content that we don't wanna be associated with. Um, so it is it is a, a big focus. Um, viewability is another one, right? We wanna make sure our content is viewable. Um, so Mode is another partner that we that we use for that. So there, there are ways to, to make sure that when we're in the digital landscape that we're using the right tools to make sure that we're 100% brand safe, brand safe, and that it's real uh, inventory and consumers that we're hitting. So back to what I think you kind of mentioned it a little bit. One of the questions here is how do you currently buy CTV and OTT, um, publisher direct or through a partner? So I, my personal opinion is that it, it should be both, right? Um, again, depending on the client. Some may be very audience driven, as I mentioned, and the content isn't as important, but I think what we're, what we're finding, especially with the shift from linear, the content is just as important as reaching very specific audiences. So the way that we approach that is by doing a combination of both an audience-based CTV buying solution through programmatic, coupled with a more premium, partner like a Hulu or Roku is another one, which I consider more programmatic in that we know people have a Roku device, but they can be accessing inventory through any application mm -hmm. on that device. Um, so that's kind of like in the middle in my mind. 
Um, but I think it's really important to make sure we're aligned with the content that makes sense for the client. It's also going to have greater reach. Um, and again, with Netflix and Disney coming out with their ad supported products, I think this is really going to be, you're going to see this shift of um, audience buying really being able to be coupled with premium content. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. So last question I have here, unless anyone puts more in. Um, so on the content side, does CTV as a tactic in general do a good job of serving multiple creative variations to the same target? So let's say you create three to five different 15 or six second videos that highlight different features or benefits. Um, is CTV a good tactic to use to kind of serve all of those to the same target audience? It's, it's tough because of the engagement factor not being there, right? So when we're testing video content or any type of ad content in a digital space, social or, or display, um, it's easier for us to say, we can test different creatives against each other and know where we saw more engagement because they were clicking through more on one piece of content versus another. Um, it is more difficult on a CTV, on the CTV side because like I said, for the most part, it's going to be completely viewable. Um, people are going to watch the whole piece of content. So it's a little bit tougher. Um, we you do use web traffic as a way to, to judge how, um, the, how CTV content has impacted consumers. Um, so similar to what we would do for linear TV, we marry up um, when the spot aired, so when the impression happens, um, versus when we saw either direct site traffic um, or a search happen, an organic or, or paid search ad that serves and delivers them to the website um, to correlate the impact of a CTV ad um, based on website traffic. So that would be kind of a proxy that we would use. But in general, I think the idea of CTV being digital and our ability to nuance our messaging, it all starts with research, right? Understanding our targets and what matters to them and, you know, what content they're interested in. Um, that I think is really important up front. And then having the ability to create nuanced content for those individual audiences is what makes it so impactful. So I, in my opinion, if it's done right up front, then we should be able to personalize our messaging for who, you know, the individual that we're trying to reach and do it that way versus having multiple pieces of content and serving it to, to everyone. Yeah, and I think, Mike, that kind of also goes back to what you were saying before. It comes down to how efficient you're being when you're actually doing your production and also your post, right? So, like, how different you could potentially make the spots with, you know, let's say it's like different ends or, or different beginnings or donuts or however you're doing it, right? So to make sure that either the content's different enough so that if I, as a target, am seeing an ad by a brand, two different ads that I think I'm seeing either, am I seeing the same thing twice or am I seeing something that's different? So I think that, you know, leans into what you were saying before about how efficient you're being with your production and, and being able to swap things out. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so that's all of the questions that we have. Um, thank you everyone for asking questions. I love when there's questions. <laughs> Um, it just, you know, it makes for a more lively discussion, obviously. So, again, I just want to thank Sam and Mike um, for joining me today. Um, and thank you for everyone for attending. Um, I, like I mentioned in the beginning, we'll be sending out a recording of this to everyone who attended and, and also those who didn't get a chance but registered. And we'll also have this up on our website and um, we'll link out to it on our social pages as well. And we hope that you'll all join us in October, date to be determined for our next webinar, where we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing attribution. So thanks again, everyone. Hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks so much.